Well, good morning, church. We're glad that you've joined us online today. We're happy to be here broadcasting from the church again this morning. Uh, I want to read a scripture for you this morning. In light of all the things that are happening in this world, the turmoil that is going on, uh, we go to the scriptures and we find comfort and peace, knowing that God is in control. Psalm 62 says, For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is, in, is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. And this is the really cool part. It says, I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. And then it says, trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Aren't you glad today that God alone is our refuge? We put our trust in him. Let's pray as we begin our service together. Father, we thank you for your holy word that gives us words of comfort and peace and direction that let us know that we are uh, your child and that you have control of our lives and control of this world. So God, today, as we worship together and pray together and learn from your word together, uh, would you bless our time together in Jesus' name, amen. So we're gonna begin just by singing together. Why don't you sing with us?
Hey kids, Pastor John here. Ever since COVID happened and we stopped being able to gather together on Sunday mornings, we've been sending an email to your parents each weekend with all of the activities and the videos and the Bible stories that we would have taught you if we'd been able to be here together. Also on Thursday nights, we've been meeting for an online kids Zoom party and we've had a great time together. We're so glad that we've been able to spend an hour each week with so many of you. Last Thursday was our final online kids party for the spring because school finished on Friday. And usually when school's finished and we finish up here, you know what we do? We have a party together. So coming up next Sunday afternoon on June 14th, we're going to have a drive through ice cream and costume party. It'll be from two o'clock until four o'clock here in the church parking lot. We'll do all of the things that we need to do to be socially distant from each other, but we can't wait to see you. So watch your email and check Facebook for all the details. My teacher asked me to write a story. My story about the pandemic. I didn't even know pandemic was a word. But now that's all I hear and think. Everything has changed. I can't play with my friends. I feel things I don't know how to say. But I now know how Bluey feels. Stuck in a bowl. I have to stay six feet away from everyone. The pandemic has made the whole world lonely and sad. I miss my meme mom so much. I want to give her a hug, but I can't. I'm scared. But my mom says, now's not the time to be scared. Now's the time to believe. Believe that even though the world's broken, there's still hope. Hope that something good can come out of this. Hope that this will make us closer and teach us how to love better. Now's a perfect time to be a light in the darkness. Because we need each other more than ever. So I make masks for my neighbors. I show kindness. I pray. And I never forget to wash my hands. I used to think that 2020 was the worst year ever invented. It gave us a lot of rules and a new normal. But now I see, it also showed us how much we all need each other. And it showed us that we should never give up on hope. Cause no storm could last forever. And the day after a rain is always the most beautiful. Pandemic. It's now a part of all our stories. And like all good stories, there's some sadness, but always hope. Morning, church family. I'm so glad that we were able to connect like this. We know that, as we've been saying for so long, it's, it's less than ideal, but yet... We appreciate the encouragement and the response that we hear uh, pretty much daily each week that this is helpful and a way for us to, to keep connected and caring for one another. And on that note, um, we do appreciate as well, I know the staff here are doing their utmost to, to check in and to formulate strategies so that we can express our care actively, and yet we're a large church family. And 
we just want to continue to encourage all of you who are taking the time to make a phone call and to check in with uh, your fellow church family members and your neighbors and those around you. Thank you for extending the, the light and the love of Christ Jesus. Um, we appreciate that so much. And in regards to some of the initiatives that are going on right now, um, our uh, Reverend Sterling Gosman Memorial Prayer Chapel, and we know that this coming Saturday would mark the anniversary of uh, Pastor Sterling's home going, and we still very much miss him. And of course, we would commend uh, Anne and the family to you as you continue to remember them at this time in prayer. But the portrait that is being commissioned in his honor and memory, um, last I heard, there, we're well on our way to reaching our goal of uh, $3,000 um, by a painter who loves the Lord and a painter whose works hang in Rideau Hall, I'm told. And she's very accomplished and uh, it's going to be a beautiful a portrait and something that we do together as a church family. Thank you for your support. And, and again, we're well on our way, but there's certainly still room there, if you haven't already, to uh, make a donation in memory and honor of Pastor Sterling Gosman to have this portrait done and so that we can uh, move toward uh, commissioning the uh, Memorial Chapel in his honor. Also, I just want to say that I uh, appreciate the help as well, extended to the Alakari family and what I am told in an update is uh, the monetary support is great beyond that right now. The, the primary issue is that we keep hitting the wall of when employment looks promising. The uh, discouragement is that uh, the proficiency in English is not quite there yet. So we are praying um, for you know, motiv motivational drive in them to, to continue to pursue this, but they need help. They need uh, others who will come alongside and bravely take the initiative to um, instruct and, and to encourage so that they might grow in their English proficiency, which will greatly help the uh, employment opportunities. So if God's speaking to you on that, it's, uh, again, not always a monetary issue. In fact, it's just it's coming alongside and loving and caring as you would want somebody to do for you. Uh, thank you, church. Again, for your support, these are the days as we've, we were projecting the 2020 vision and considering multi-site. Well, we are now a multi-site church, really. We are now establishing a church um, site online. There's on-site here in this beautiful building and property that God has blessed us with, but there's also now the reality that uh, we are a church online, online, and um, we're hearing more and more because of your hearts and inviting family and friends that we have uh, dear people tuning in from all over the valley who have never come through our physical door, but have now come in to the digital door of our church and are tuning in. Um, and out of curiosity, but many because of your invitation, which is huge. And so all those here this morning who are tuning in and tracking with us, and uh, you've never come right on the property yet, but you are, I hope and pray, feeling more and more a part of of our church family here at New Minus Baptist Church, we're glad that you are joining us here on uh, the live streams on Sunday morning. So thank you for doing so. And thank you, church, for your uh, monetary support. Again, the costs to do this um, are there. We're doing everything we can to be good stewards of God's gifts in many other ways to save. But uh, the expenses are there. So if you've ever contemplated, you know, you wanted to get behind something and you want to learn about automating your gifts so that they're um, digitally given each week, um, we would love to help you do that. Now is the time. Now is the time. Let's not miss this opportunity that God has given us. We're all in. We're gospel, a missional people. So I want to um, pray, and then we're going to prepare our hearts for communion, the Lord's Supper here this morning. So let's pray. Let's pray together. Father, I love how Jesus, your eternal son, taught us to begin with our Father, that it is more than ourselves individually. It lifts us out of our navel gazing and only being preoccupied with our own life and worries. But God, we're a family. You are our Father. And a good, good Father. And you invite us to come to to remember afresh that we only exist because of your good pleasure in bringing us into existence. And you were not willing that 
humanity remain alienated from you, but you desire to oh owe God a plan of rescue and redemption in sending Jesus, who did for us what we could never do for ourselves. And this reality is, of salvation is applied to our lives with our eyes being opened through the power and ministry of the third person of you, the great triune God, the Holy Spirit. We're a part, by your grace, of this eternal, forever triune family, now multiplied out and sharing in this love and joy together. This is what we were made for, oh God. And Father, you know the, the daily practical needs that we have, and you invite us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. And not just this month or this year, but each day, give us this day. And so you invite us to come, Father. And you listen to your children's prayers. Father, you know the overwhelming anxieties of the uncertainty of these days and the pressures that that bring down upon your people. God, I know that you want to lift that. You tell us that if we first, in Matthew 6, seek your kingdom to do your will here on earth as it is in heaven, that you will supply our food and our clothing and our shelter and our health. Oh God, you promised that. So Lord, it's forgive us, however, when we get it backwards, when we get it wrong, and we start immediately thinking of ourselves, we start immediately looking for love in all the wrong places when we were first to have our eyes fixed on Jesus, that beautiful interface between us and you, oh God. So Lord, listen to your children praying. We confess our, our falling away, we confess our wandering, we confess, oh God, then being anxious and angry and mad and our relationships suffer and there's conflict and division and strife and oh God, how we see it in the world, how we reap what we sow. Father, the racial injustices that are so wrong. God, we want to stand in solidarity against those things. We want to listen humbly, oh God, how we can do better and be more intentional Individually and as a church family, oh God, here in the valley, here in Nova Scotia, and here in Canada. Father, we ask that uh, you continue to be with our Syrian families, the Muhammad family, the al family. We think in particular of the al and, and the necessity of, of English proficiency, especially for Muhammad as he seeks employment, oh God. I pray if you're speaking to those in our church who maybe have not yet um, but yet they have the qualifications. Maybe they don't even feel like this is something they could do. They feel a little bit um, anxious about that. God, I pray your peace and calm and that they would um, look to our, our, our mission team, our refugee mission team, and uh, contact us and we can make those connections. And Lord, just do everything we can to help in this regard. Lord, we continue to pray with those, Lord, who are, are grieving and grieving in the sense of loved ones who have passed away. And during these crazy days of isolation and separation, Lord, and, and, and the awkwardness of knowing how to even support and help. Thank you for the lifting of some of the restrictions. Thank you for the ability now for um, increased bubbling and families to be able to be together. Lord, continue to watch over, however, those frontline workers. Help us, Father, as we contemplate reopening strategies that, that we have your wisdom in it. Father, we've been praying for a COVID vaccine that it may come sooner rather than later. Be with all those grads, oh God, who um, are grieving that it's not a, a way to celebrate as they had anticipated and dreamed about. But God, I, I trust that uh, our church family will help our, our high school grads, oh God, to celebrate. I know you will, and upcoming and drive um, through support and celebration for the, the students and teachers and parents through this, this difficult time that they've now come through. We could celebrate with them. Lord, there are so many things, so many things. Lord, I just pray that through your spirit, your healing touch, Lord, for those who are not well, who are sick and struggling with health issues, have come through surgery or are facing surgery, and Father, I also want to be mindful of the anxieties and pressures that we feel that as things are opening up, that we don't feel ready. 
we had great aspirations of learning another language. We had aspirations of having renovations done in our family perfect and we were going to reset and have all these things done and it just hasn't happened and now we feel guilty and we feel overwhelmed and stressed but God help us just to focus on the one or two things that you would highlight and help us not to be overwhelmed by unrealistic expectations but just breathe just breathe and rejoice in you so God we lift all these things to you now prepare our hearts and minds I ask that we enter into this sacred communion the Lord's Supper, and, and help us to understand and to grasp the full important meaning of it this day as a means of grace in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, at this time, as we quiet our hearts and prepare our minds, I'm not ignorant to the fact that in your homes, in the casual atmosphere of your homes, in the busyness of your homes, maybe with squirrely little ones uh, running all around, pets, I understand that it's not as easy to enter in, perhaps in a mind of, of worship and contemplation about uh, sacred things like communion. However, I just want to commend to you the importance of you modeling that, mom and dad, grandparents, guardians of little ones. I know it's not easy. We're very grateful, Pastor John, and the ministry to children and youth and the um, options for other um, educational, spiritual growth resources at their level that they could be watching in another room or another place. And yet we've also sent out not only instructions on the Lord's Supper, how to do this reverently, but also to share and help our, our children and youth to understand as well. So I just want to encourage you that, one, I know it's not easy, but please resist the temptation to make it somewhat all too casual and to model um, by intentionality and focus into how important it is to, to worship together and especially around the Lord's Supper. So I just want to encourage and commend that to you. We come in obedience to the Lord's command. This is something that Jesus ordained that was important. The Lord's Supper represents the, the bread, his uh, body, his perfect body. He, without sin, was broken so that we might be made whole. The cup, the juice, the wine represent his blood shed for us that we might be made whole. Sins forgiven, washed and cleansed. 
For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins, the writer of the book of Hebrews tells us. If you're not yet a committed follower of Jesus, perhaps you're just inquiring about these things, I would encourage you not to, to, to take them until you can take them knowledgeably, having the affirmation of God's spirit that you are reborn. This is not something to, to trifle with. If you would like to know more information, please email uh, me, one of the pastors, and we would love to, to go to the scriptures on how you can know um, and have assurance that, that you are a redeemed and rescued daughter and son of God, and then more knowledgeably and joyfully partake of this sacred supper. It is a service for, for believers, and we certainly love that there are those who are curious and watching and that they are here and welcome to observe I'm just going to pray. Father, this bread represents the body of Jesus who said to us, in keeping with the letter to the Corinthians that Paul wrote, that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body that is given for you. Do this. He encouraged us in remembrance of him. It's remembering all that he has done for us all that he has done for us. He lived the life we should have lived in our place, in a body just like ours, so he could identify with us as human beings. And so God, help us to remember this as we partake of this bread this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'd invite you, if you have the bread this morning, to receive it with thanksgiving. As we move to the cup, you know, I, we don't do this in mechanically or just jumping through the hoops. You know, I am this morning grateful that I am human and that God's given me a palate. And I can tell you that piece of bread here this morning, I don't know about the bread that you're partaking, but it's moist and it was good and it was very tasty. How much more spiritually when we partake of the manna from heaven, which is the sweet Lord Jesus, and we dine on him and his teachings and his life for us. How sweet is the bread of heaven. When we consider the cup, we want to pray as well. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word breathed out by the Holy Spirit, encapsulated in the early letters to the early churches. One, especially from Paul to the Corinthian church, where he says also in the same way, Jesus took this cup. And after supper, Jesus said, the cup is representative of the new covenant in my blood. His blood shed for us. He did not need to shed his blood for he was guilt free without sin. that he would love us so much that it was a joy set before him that he would endure the torture and crucifixion so that he could rescue us and fulfill the old covenant which we could not or demand perfect righteousness we could not but he fulfilled it for us and he paid the penalty and the consequence of our breaking the law by dying the death that we deserved in our place as our substitute and therefore his shed blood represents the new covenant of new life and new beginning, purification made whole and new that we could stand before a holy God. So Father, help us through your spirit to remember all that Jesus has done for us as we drink this cup, representative of the new covenant in his blood. Amen. Let's drink with thankful hearts. Jesus, we read in the gospel, said that this, his blood is the new covenant poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins, and it changes and transforms us. That's what it does. 
And we need to do this often in remembrance of him because we're so prone to leak out the gospel. We're so prone to be distracted. Our love gets misguided. And a part of our love and a part of our transformation in Christ is to love our neighbor as ourselves, which we're going to hear about this morning. And a part of doing that is practically through our benevolent ministry. And our benevolent ministry is not a condescending to others, looking down upon them, but it's coming alongside. As Pastor Sterling often would say, it's not a handout, but a hand up. And Pastor Paul Fowler and uh, Tammy Bask and John Lake and the benevolent team and Pastor Siobhan, um, all of us teaming up together to make sure that your gifts that you give on the communion Sundays is direct it to those who need it most as an expression of God's love and your love as well. So thank you so very much. So let's uh, continue to worship. We're going to now uh, sing together the remainder of this song. Again, I know it's not easy in your homes and if it's chaotic, again, you're focusing in, you're modeling what it is to worship and put God first means so very much. Bless your hearts. Let's sing together the remainder of this song. Good morning again. Again, we are glad for the dynamic of live streaming that uh, we have this opportunity together. You know, so appreciate it, Pentecost Sunday. Now as we enter into today and Trinity Sunday, and there's such deep, profound theological truths. So I'll do my utmost to try to um, express this clearly and concisely. It's going to require all of us focusing in today. The Trinity is profound. We can only go by what God has revealed to us, and we are not going to venture from that, but it is mysterious, deep, and profound, but it has such important implications for our lives. You know, recently I read about two young city boys, call them city slickers, city boys. They'd never been out of the city, but they were on their very first camping trip out in the country, out in the woods, And the mosquitoes were so fierce that they spent most of their time just hiding, as it was getting dark, hiding under their covers for for fear of being devoured by the mosquitoes. And they next saw some fireflies, not sure what they were, thinking they were still mosquitoes. One of the boys exclaimed, we may as well give up. They're coming at us with flashlights now. And uh, 
If you've ever been out there, especially this time of year and with this rain, there's lots of mosquitoes. But do you know, in the darkness of this old world, I welcome any light, including the light of fireflies. We need light in this dark and gloomy world. These have been tough months for us. They've not been easy at all. COVID, isolation, economic woe, mass shootings, tragic crashes, and all have especially rocked Nova Scotia. And in these last several days, conflict and division that has escalated over systemic racial injustices. Sadly, these things continue in the world and remind us that we are still so dark and terribly broken. The title of the message here is The Blessed Trinity and the World's Woes. Again, I am trying, I want us to understand that these are important biblical truths that have helpful implications for our lives in the darkness and in the world's woes. We can apply the revelation of God to us through his word, especially when it comes to the doctrine of the blessed trinity, of the blessed trinity. You see, we are made for light. We're made for love, and we are yearning after such things. It reminds me of what the prophet Isaiah said in chapter 59. He said, the way of peace they do not know. And there is no justice in their paths. Does that not resonate? They have made their roads crooked. We've left the straight and narrow and we, we want to go down crooked roads and we think that we're going to find peace and justice. We won't find it down crooked roads. No one who treads on them finds peace. Therefore, the prophet Isaiah says, justice is far from us and righteousness has not overtaken us. We hope for light, and behold, darkness. We hope for brightness, but we walk in gloom. But yet, we as God fears, those who reverence him, those of us who are Christ followers, those of us who are led and empowered by the Spirit, we have hope, and we know that the blessed Trinity is the answer. The blessed Trinity is the answer to all the world's woes. It is. And I hope that you will come to see it, maybe for the first time, or to have it affirmed in your life here even more this morning. You see, the biblical teaching, the biblical doctrine of the Trinity, concisely defined would be that God eternally and simultaneously exists as three distinct persons. One God, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And no one invented this. Profound thinkers like C.S. Lewis and many others, it was a a leading um, impetus behind them coming to faith in Christ when they considered the threeness of God. No one could have come up with this. No one invented it, but God revealed it about himself, this truth. In Luke chapter 10, when we had spent some time there examining uh, Mary and Martha and how it's bookended by the Good Samaritan story and the 72 disciples coming back, they come back and they're all amped up because of the power that they had over spirits. And Jesus chides them and um, reminds them, don't get so amped up about that you have power, but that your names are written in heaven. But God's grace alone. It's not about power over people or things. And in that... um, Luke chapter 10, I came across and it just rejoiced my heart. It says that how in the same hour he rejoiced, Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit as he praised and thanked God. You see God the Son rejoicing in God the Holy Spirit as he thanked and praised God the Father. Beautiful in Luke's gospel there in chapter 10. A picture of the Holy Blessed Trinity. I loved it. You see, within the divine essence, there's a plurality of personhood. There is no inferiority or subordination of essence among the members of the Trinity. Yes, they have different distinct roles, but in their essence, there's no inferiority or subordination. The three persons are co-equal in nature, attributes, and glory. 
In the very first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, it says that God, in verse 26, said, let us, plural, make man in our, plural, image. After our, plural, likeness. And then in verse 27, we see the the oneness of God, the unity of God, when he says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male, Adam, female, Eve. He created them. We see both the oneness and the threeness of our God, unique among all world religions and views. This is the biblical doctrine, not only of the Trinity, but the biblical doctrine of emigo dei, Latin for being made in the image of God. And being made in the image of God means that humanity has the capability to love, to be wise, to lead, to serve, to create, to be holy as God is holy, to be forgiving as God is forgiving, to be patient, to be merciful and gracious. Because of imago dei, every single person, therefore, and this is so important, every single person has an inherent worth and value and is therefore to be treated with dignity and respect. Made in the image of the triune God, therefore we were created for relationships. How often have you heard me say that? Relationships where vertically we love God. We have a relationship foremost with him and we love one another horizontally. And Jesus taught us in Matthew 22, you shall love the Lord, your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. It's all about love. And secondly, it is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Your neighbor as yourself. In the words of Mr. Rogers, which we'll look at a little later, will you be my neighbor? Will you be my neighbor? Just then in Luke 10, we see that a young lawyer, ambitious in theology, steps up and he asks, well, who is my neighbor? And Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan which deals with racial tension and issues and religiosity. Who is my neighbor? And tragically, in that story that Jesus told, religiously-minded people get it all wrong. And if we were created then for loving relationships, what went wrong? Maybe it's important that we understand that. You see, Adam and Eve, when things went wrong, it wasn't that they stopped loving They were created as lovers in the image of God, a loving God. But their love was turned from God. And this is the crux of original sin. The very sin that caused death and heartache and sorrow to come into the world. You see, it's more than disobedience, but it's a misdirected love. The Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 3, regarding the issue of, and why we're called sinners, he says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, because we're lovers of ourselves, lovers of money, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God. That, that's the crux of the issue. Created to love God, we instead default to, to love ourselves, to put ourselves first and foremost, and love and chase after anything else but God. And it's just exactly what happened in the Garden of Eden with what we call original sin. Eve ate of the forbidden fruit because of a love of herself, doubting God's love, God's best for her. She believed a lie and she put herself first. She desired to be wiser than God and that eclipsed any love that she might have had for God in that moment. She succumbed to that temptation In Genesis 3, it said, when that woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. So more than merely disobedience, her act of sin was an indication that her heart was turning away from God's love. She desired the fruit more than she desired God. James, 
in his book in the New Testament defines sin and how it works in noting how it, it's a misdirected love and desire for someone or something. He says in chapter 1, each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he's dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin and sin when it's full grown, grown gives birth to death. And this is what went wrong in the garden with our first parents. You see, they were created in the image of a loving God for a loving relationship first and foremost with him. But they were tempted and they doubted and they turned away from God to find their own way in the world. And instead then of running to God for fellowship and love, they now were running from him to hide. And that's indicative of humanity outside of God. We will look for love in all the wrong places. We don't even want to contemplate the idea, the thought of God, and we turn and we're, we run from him. So you see, our understanding of the doctrine of the Trinity, that we are made in the image of a relational triune God, we are therefore made for relationships. When we grasp this truth, it helps us to see the danger and the consequence of our sin in misdirected love that we see in the lives of Adam and Eve, that there's a proclivity within all of us to turn from God and his love. Incredibly, however, and this is the most beautiful thing, is that the very rejection of God then became the manifestation of the love of God for the world. God's response to that sin revealed the very essence of who he is. He didn't come down and crush us with his fist. He had every right. He had forewarned our first parents. But instead, he manifested his great love for humanity. We read about this in 1 John chapter 4. It says, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He, this is how. How did God show his love among us? Well, here's how. He sent his one and only son, the eternal son, and the glory they had together, he sent his son to come into the world that we might live through him. This is, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins, which we experienced and which we see in the beautiful ordinance of the Lord's Supper. You see, the cross of Christ reveals to us and for all the world to see the depth of what it means that God is love. 1 John 3.16, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. So in keeping with Trinity Sunday and what God has done in expressing and manifesting his love for us, we see that each person of the blessed Trinity is involved in the, the logical, consequential steps of our Salvation. Let's look at that this morning. I think it would be good. Firstly, we see motivated by love. God the Father is the architect of our rescue and our redemption. God the Father is the one who sent his son to save us sinners. He loved us before we ever loved him. So the Father is the architect. He initiated salvation. What his justice and his holiness demanded that all sin be punished, his mercy and love provided in sending his son. The second person of the blessed trinity, then God the Son, didn't come as a victim. He wasn't coerced or forced. But God the eternal Son said, yes, Father, I will go. I will take upon myself their flesh, their humanity, so that I can pay the penalty of their sin and die in their place on the cross. I will shed my blood for them. And when Jesus proclaimed in John chapter 19, verse 30, it is finished, we see that the Son God the Son achieved for us our salvation. He accomplished it. And the third person of the blessed Trinity, the Holy Spirit, he applies what the Father as the architect and the Son accomplished, the Holy Spirit applies to our lives in his threefold work of convicting people of sin, awaking them to their error, that their eyes might be opened. We see this in John 16, verse 8. 
the Holy Spirit's work of regenerating our hearts, bringing new birth, applying the resurrection of Jesus to our lives. We see this in Titus 3.5. And thirdly, the Holy Spirit's work of enabling people then to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, 1 Corinthians 12.3. Nicky Cruz, some of you would know who he is, but this is going back to the 50s before I was born. But uh, Nicky Cruz became well-known because of uh, Pastor um, Wilkerson, who as an early Baptist pastor, felt compelled, even though there was unrest and turmoil racially in the inner city of New York among the gangs who were fighting and killing each other, the youth, young people, Pastor Wilkerson goes and, and bravely shares with them the gospel of Christ. And Nikki Cruz, with a Puerto Rican racial background, um, comes to faith in Jesus. And, and the book that was written called The Cross and the Switchblade became a well-known movie starring Pat Boone. Um, a lot of people, again, know about, but what I didn't realize, and I only learned this week, is that Nikki Cruz also wrote a book called The Magnificent Three. What a great title, The Magnificent Three. And Nikki Cruz, in searching, hungry for the scriptures and understanding his faith, could see the work of God the Father in sending the Son, and God the Son in securing and achieving his salvation for him, and God the Holy Spirit applying it to his daily life, and he rejoices in this, and it's a powerful book called The Magnificent Three. You see, the Trinity is incredibly important for many, many reasons, but just for a few points here now, I want us to think a little deeper on this, why this is important. We can't dismiss it. The Trinity is important first because, think about it, if Jesus is merely a created being, if Jesus is merely a created being and not fully God as well, then it's hard to see how he, a creature, could ever have bear the full wrath of God against all sin. You see, no creature, no matter how great that creature is, could ever do such a thing, could ever then be qualified to save us. Secondly, if Jesus is not fully God, he could not receive our worship or our prayers. Only an all-knowing, omniscient God can hear and respond to our prayers and receive our worship. And yet we know that Jesus is not merely a created human um, taken on our likeness, but it would be idolatry if We worship merely a creature, but he's fully God, and the New Testament commands and encourages our worship of Jesus Christ, and rightly so. And thirdly, the nature, the personal nature of God that I want to focus in on this morning is at stake. If there is no Trinity, then there would be no interpersonal relationships within the being of God before creation, before anything was spoken into existence. And without personal relationships, it's difficult to see if there were no interpersonal relationship within the triune God before creation, it's difficult to see how God then can relate relationally, personally. And also fourthly, the doctrine of the Trinity is important because of the unity of the universe and creation itself. If if there is not perfect plurality, and perfect unity, plurality and perfect unity, in God himself as a triune being, then we have no basis for thinking that there can be any ultimate unity among the diverse elements of creation, the universe, and especially among human relationships. If there's no perfect plurality and unity within God. And yet we know that God himself has both loving unity and diversity. So it's not surprising that loving unity and diversity can also be and should be reflected in our human relationships because we bear the image and likeness of God. We see this in many ways, but a few primary examples is firstly, we see it in marriage. When God created man in his own image, he did not create merely isolated individuals. But scripture, as we've already heard, created God created male and female. And in the unity of marriage, we see not a triunity as God, but we see an incredible unity of two persons who, while they remain distinct individuals, they also become one body, mind, and spirit. 
Another example of unity and diversity is in the church, in our church family. We know that we have many members, yet one body. The Apostle Paul reflected upon this, great diversity among the members. He uses the analogy of the human body in 1 Corinthians 12 and says that the church is like that. We have many different members in our churches with many different gifts, many different backgrounds, experiences, and interests. And we depend, however, we're interdependent to help one another while demonstrating the beautiful diversity and the beautiful unity at the same time. We see different people doing many different things in the life of the church. And it should cause us to thank and to praise God that he would allow us to reflect his image and glory through our unity and diversity because of the Trinity. So the the doctrine of the Trinity is right or all else is wrong. That's how crucial it is. The doctrine of the Trinity is right or all else is wrong. The Trinity is not a dusty old doctrine, out of date, but it's a crucial word, Trinity, that encapsulates the most important teachings of Christianity. If you pull the thread of the Trinity out of Scripture, the whole thing falls apart. It has huge implications for all of life, the doctrine of the Trinity. Augustine, an early church leader, He pointed out that you can't say that God is love without a triune God. Otherwise, God would be impersonal in the real sense of love. Love cannot exist in solitude. Love is only love if it is shared. Now, we're going to go a little deeper. So get your mask and your snorkel on. Here we go. We're going to go a little deeper. I know you can do this. The Holy Spirit's going to help us this morning. Think about it. If God were a singular, one-person God, as other religions would say, if God were a singular, one-person God, in order to experience love, he would have had to create others to love, which would mean that power would have come before love. As such, it would mean that the essential thing about life would be to have power And those with the most power would rule all others. But if God is tri-personal, in essence in being from all eternity, which he is, and he has always existed eternally as love itself between each member of the Holy Trinity, it would mean that it was out of love that God first created all things so that love therefore, is the most essential thing to life, not power. Love, then, is to be the basis, the foundation for everything. Love, even of power, which God gives us. And this has implication for every area of your life and mine. And how humanity loves each other is at the very heart of God's plan. This means that God's people believe that love and relationships are the most important things over any accruing of power and privilege to dominate others. I know it's not easy. As broken people in a broken world, but our triune God who is love has promised to fill us with the Holy Spirit to give us all the energy and the resources to live out his love, to rightly love ourselves and to rightly love our neighbors as ourselves. We see this gift in many places in God's word for the ability and the energy to do what at times we wrestle with what is right and what is wrong and how to love as we should. But we see in Romans chapter five, it says we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not put us to shame because God's love, there it is, God's love has been poured into our hearts. He's pouring it in through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. God never gives power. He never gives authority unless it is to rightly love and serve others to his glory. 
And this is the question. How you and I interact and treat others reveals what we believe in God. So if we were to do a review of your life, how is it that you are treating and interacting with your family, with your coworkers? You see, our differences and diversity, our differences and our diversity are beautiful because God designed them for his glory and expressive creativity. In the first book, it's bookended. The first book of the Bible in Genesis, we read in Genesis 12 that there's the promise of God that all people, all races will be glad in Christ. And in the last book of the Bible, in Revelation chapter 5, we read that every tribe, every tongue, every nation will be gathered together in praise and love around the throne of God. It's beautiful. In a beautiful mosaic, God made every individual and race of people in his image, imago dei. As Christ followers, therefore, we should appreciate and celebrate all racial diversity and beauty and to do everything we can, everything we can through God's love and energy to ensure that every race, especially our black brothers and sisters at this time, be treated with dignity and respect, to mistreat or devalue anyone or any race of people, therefore, is not only cruel, and wrong, but it is also a disrespect to a holy God who made us. The despicable murders of Amud Arbery and George Floyd have caused such terrible pain and heartache for their families, lives that will never, they will not decide to have and get back but it was also an atrocity to the image of God. No image bearer of God should ever inflict such disgrace or horror on another image bearer of God. Black men and women have experienced being held down in their breath, taken from them for far too long. God would have us stand together as we see his word call us to do to listen long and humbly on how we can best support one another and speak up for all image bearers of God. Do you know the word solitary? Solitary means to exist alone. Solidarity speaks of unity of common interests and mutual support within a group. We were not created for solitary life, but solidarity. Our diversity is a strength. Every support, every act of kindness and love counts. It's huge. I watched recently, as many of you, on the various interviews through the media, and Jerome Aginla has always been a, um, just one of my favorite athletes, NHL hockey player, continues to be He follows Christ, and I love his testimony. He was recently interviewed, and he talked about how as a young hockey player, that's when he first faced racial hostility. An opposing player hurled threats and racial slurs at him, but a referee, again, let's say, a referee heard it, stopped everything, and severely reprimanded the player. And the parents as well that heard of it stood in support and let it be known that there was no place for that kind of behavior. And the players sought out Jerome after this game, acknowledged what he had said and done was way offside, he said to Aginla. And Aginla said he sincerely apologized. Sadly, it's not always like that, but it should be. Those are not small moments. In the life of a famous athlete like Jerome Aginla, he remembers that. It was pivotal in his life. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, one of the top basketball players on the planet in his day. I watched recently as many people are looking to him. He spoke about how people are choking on the dust of racial injustices and they're choking and dying on it, but no one sees it until the light comes in and then you see the dust. He says, now that there's light being focused on this, he had encouraged all of us. They're asking, what should we do? 
And he said, have dialogue about it. It may be uncomfortable, but talk about these racial injustices. And he said, listen carefully and respectfully to one another. Such sage advice. But more importantly, he said this that stuck with me. He said, practically find somebody who's not like you and make a friend with them. Be a friend with them. Someone who's totally different. Look for that person and befriend them. Do you know, last Sunday as I was preaching, and some of you know this, I've been over the last probably number of months playing with my ear, feeling plugged, and last Sunday I arrived, I could not hear out of, out of my left ear at all. It was frustrating. I was determined. I went home and I did the olive oil thing in my ears, you know, overnight and everything, and uh, finally took a, you know, an, an ear wash syringe and washed that ugly ear wax. It took a while, came out, and uh, my hearing was restored. What a blessed thing. You don't realize by little increments how deaf you become. It's slow in little increments. But once your ears are flushed out, all of a sudden you hear like never before. And I'm telling you this morning, you may not think you're tone deaf. But the reality is many of us are tone deaf spiritually. And when it comes to social justice that God calls us to and the importance that black lives matter, and they do, and we just can't dismiss that. We need to no longer be tone deaf. We need to listen and to Ask good questions and ask God to help us not to remain blind either to the pain and the trauma of those around us who may be different from us, but they're our neighbor in the truest sense. They are made in the image of God as we are. This week, in case you're wondering, you know, sometimes, you know, if you say something, you in this cancellation culture, you could be taken to task because, and so you're paralyzed. And when you say something, you're not so sure how it's going to be received. And you may wonder, like as Pastor Daniel or anyone, quietly, I want you to know that we were a part of a number of churches who didn't put it out there for everyone to see, but we, each of us in our churches and us as a staff made a short little video assuring the African United Baptist Association, our dear black sisters and brothers and friends, that we are with them against all racial injustices. And we apologize sincerely for not listening and doing more and ask for their help and assure them that we would stand in solidarity in the coming days. And I just want you to know as a New Minus Baptist Church family that, that we have been about this. Misha Berger Gosman sent me a video where she openly and transparently shares her heart. I tweeted that out. So let us be resisting the tendency to be tone deaf. And by God's help, let us flush out our spiritual hearing that we could pause and ask God to teach us in this moment. So in conclusion today, on this Trinity Sunday, if you haven't already seen the movie, A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood about the life of Mr. Rogers, um, it was more creative and artistic and beautiful than I thought it would be. And uh, I would commend it to you. In that movie, there is a, a journalist who, he's so bitter and angry, but he can't see it. And in his life, he, um, he's burned so many bridges with doing interviews, even though he's a great journalist with other people that no one really wants to talk to him because they're afraid of him. And so his editor gives him a, his next uh, journalistic task, and it's to interview Mr. Rogers, and he's, he's appalled, he's, he's insulted, he thinks it's beneath him, um, but she says, no one else will talk to you, and we need to run a piece about Mr. Rogers, and so he goes, and, and he studies, and he's skeptical, and what he discovers, he's, he's even more upset about, and so he's shadowing uh, Mr. Rogers, played by Tom Hanks, really well in the movie, and they get on this subway, and um, the journalist leans in to Mr. Rogers and he says, um, I've been watching your program. And Mr. Rogers says, oh, I'm so glad that you've, you've taken the time to actually watch it, you know? And he says, yeah, you, you talk about divorce and death and war. It's really dark. Like he's, he's grilling him. He's like, he's mad at him. And Mr. Rogers, he just, he's, just, he's just looking at him because you see, Mr. Rogers knew about this journalist. He knew how bitter and how he shredded all kinds of people in very awful ways in his uh, journalistic articles. But Mr. Rogers felt called to this man. And so he just listened to him, and then he looked up, and he said, hey, do you know the most beautiful word in sign language? And he talked about a young child who just had recently taught him it. He said, it's like this. And he took his two index fingers, 
And he went like this, and he went like that. He said, it means friend. It means friend. And the journalist's not sure, like, what are you telling me this for? And just then, all the people on that subway start singing the Mr. Rogers in the Neighborhood song. And you saw in the picture, you have the policemen, African-Americans, Asians, Caucasian, and it was just a beautiful scene, glimpses and tastes of heaven, of the importance of loving our neighbor. And I am ending with this, and I don't want to go on and give everything away in the movie, but there was a very poignant part as well, where the journalist is starting to let his defenses down, his heart is starting to be worked on by, I believe, the Holy Spirit through Mr. Rogers, and even though he had turned and he was angry and was going to give up on it, he, he, he again, he comes to Mr. Rogers and Mr. Rogers takes him out to lunch and they're in a restaurant. And Mr. Rogers is trying to open up his life about what's really behind all the, the bitterness and the hatred. And the journalist opens up about his being very angry at his dad because his father's actions selfishly and some ways brought upon the death of his mom at a young age. And Mr. Rogers is helping him to see that, you know, everyone, even those who we feel are so against us, everyone has been used to shape our lives. He said, even that helped you to have the deep convictions you have, Mr. Rogers said to the journalist, of what's right and wrong. Your father has shaped you in good ways. And the guy's not sure how to take that. And then Mr. Roger, he says, do you know, he says, I like often to take a moment, to just pause a moment, to remember all of those, a moment of silence reflecting on all the people who loved us into being. He said, I would like to do this. Would you do this with me? I mean, they're sitting in a restaurant and he's, he's inviting this hardened journalist to take a moment of silence to remember all those who loved us into being. And the journalist goes, um, no, not really. And Mr. Rogers just calmly persists, looks at his watch and he goes, they will come to you. And the crazy thing is, is in that restaurant, all the people there had heard Mr. Rogers and a silence comes on the whole restaurant. And people start to pause and to think. But all the people in their life who loved them into being. And what's so poignant and powerful about that is because God made us in his triune image. We were made for relationships. And can you imagine a movie that actually takes a full minute to pause like that? Nothing said, just pause, silence. And you see the people coming to this journalist's mind. And as I, watching the movie, I stop, I thought of my grandmother. I thought of my parents. I thought of schoolmates. I thought of bosses I had. I thought of people that were once my enemies. I thought of all those things, and they were all coming to my mind, and they helped shape me in love. I would commend that to us. What a great discipline. It was powerful. So you see, in closing this morning, the Trinity is the answer to the deepest longing of the human heart. It even clarifies the question. It makes us go deeper than sentimental notions and elusive emotions. It puts us on solid ground with all the love stuff that we've been chasing after, searching after. We're all looking for love. Deep down, we all need it in ways that we may not even fully grasp or understand. We search and we search, and all we seem to get is glimpses, tastes, and samples of loves, maybe even a bit of fleeting experiences of love. Yet nothing quite lifts us up out of ourselves and our self-interest, disappointments, and painful losses until we learn about and receive by faith the sweet, precious doctrine of the Trinity. I commend it to you. Let's pray. Gracious Father, this morning I pray that this message from your word, your eternal breathed out by the spirit word to us, a reflection of the revelation of who you are, that the truth that you are a triune God, that you are love, you have always been love, 
Therefore, we were created out of love. And love is the most crucial and essential thing in our lives. Not power. Not privilege. And help us to see afresh, oh God, that it is the gentle love of your spirit in us that will win the day. Humility and holiness in love. And Father, help us to put legs on our faith to love you first and foremost and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And to you be the glory in Christ's name. Amen.
Uh, warning, heads up, um, you've probably seen about the Q&R, the question and response. If you want to send in a, a question about uh, the message today, this being Trinity Sunday, it is a, a deep and profound teaching, a doctrine, but yet, it, as I hope you've seen this morning, has implications for every area of our lives. So please send in any clarifying question that you might have. If you also have a, an urgent prayer request, um, we would love to pray with you live this morning also. Um, you, can, you can get that into us. I'll just give you a little bit of time to uh, absorb and take this in and, and prepare a question. And I'll give you the time by just sharing a few exam uh, announcements here this morning. Uh, of course, we have uh, next Sunday that you've heard already from 2 to 4 next Sunday. It'll be a drive-through uh, celebration and come receive a treat uh, for our students, our teachers and parents um, as the school year is coming to an end. So that's next Sunday, 2 to 4. And then, of course, on Thursday nights now, we've got uh, the Amen, who are gathering through Zoom online. If you would like more information about that, uh, Pastor Chris and uh, Mark Flan would be more than happy to help you to be able to get uh, connected through that Thursday night's Amen fellowship through Zoom. And our prayer and share has a new format that we tried out uh, last week. It's new, and uh, we're still learning around it. From 7 to 7.30, the prayer team is breaking into little groups and through Zoom to pray through the list of long-term prayer requests. And um, it's an intentional time of serious intercession and prayer. And then we come out of that at 7.30, and it's live-streamed to discuss some basic questions around prayer. We discuss it biblically for spiritual growth and encouragement. And uh, that, too, we invite live questions around the topic of prayer and live prayer requests that we can be praying uh, for you about. So that's 7.30 until um, 8 o'clock this Tuesday night. So this is good that we can continue to connect as a church family with one another. And again, I am just so overjoyed um, to be surrounded by an amazing stellar team, uh, Pastor John and Pastor Paul and Pastor Chris and Pastor Siobhan and the great work that they're doing to keep us connected and caring online. Well, Pastor Chris, I'm going to turn it over to you. Maybe it'll be an sure. all very brief time today. But, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I just want to reiterate what you said about connecting. Uh, mm -hmm. We want to encourage everyone to, to take the time to connect with us. There's so many ways to do that uh, through email, through text, um, Facebook Messenger. Uh, there's a variety of ways to do that. It's just a matter of taking the time to do it. Um, I know that, you know, a lot of us are busy, uh, but we would never want you to think that we're so busy that we can't connect with you. Um, so there's Pastor Paul, who's, you know, uh, works with worship and, and, and communications. Um, if you want to get involved in worship, by all means, connect with Pastor Paul or Pastor Siobhan. Um, if you have a prayer request or there's a need, uh, you know somebody in, in your community who has a need, uh, please connect with her. Um, and Pastor Daniel and I, uh, we're always available, and Pastor John as well for um, youth and children. So please do uh, take the time to connect with us. Let us know how you're doing. Uh, we have one question in here that says, should we pray to each person of the Trinity or only to the Father? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I try to be as concise as I can. The, the reality is that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, uh, three persons, one God, each of them co-equal, uh, worthy of our worship, and can be directed um, with our prayer. Um, however, having said that, based on the teaching and the modeling of prayer, even in the life of Christ and the early church as encapsulated in the scripture, it would seem very clear that we direct our, our prayer to the Father, through the Son, and in the power of the Holy Spirit. That would be the, the order that we see modeled in the life of Christ, in his humanity, and in the early church, that uh, the Father seems to have that you know, preeminence, 
um, through the, the Son and in the power of the Holy Spirit and the Spirit's mission and role is to highlight the Son and the Son the Father. Um, again, in the essence of the Godhead, there's no inferiority or subordination, but in the role and the offices of the Godhead, there does seem to be distinct um, distinctions. And again, that's something to celebrate. So can you pray to the Holy Spirit? Yes. Um, can you pray to the Son, of course, and the Father? Yes. But uh, it would be good and right in a maturing and healthy way. And I think that the Holy Spirit would actually teach us that, that we do direct it as Jesus taught us, say our Father. And uh, through the power of the Spirit in the name of Jesus. Yeah, thank you, Pastor Daniel. Well, we're still waiting on questions. I think you did an amazing job yeah. explaining yeah. things this morning and expounding the word. So yeah. maybe that's why people have to have any questions. Yeah. Oh, wait, you have one maybe coming so. in. Uh, how can we ask the Holy Spirit to help us in reading the Bible? Mm. That's a great, great question, especially, especially where it tells us in uh, uh, Paul's letter you know, to Timothy that the Holy Spirit breathed it out. So if I was going to, uh, you know, if I had access to an author, you know, like our, our Doug Schofield, who's a writer and author and scholar in his own right, and he's written some books, um, we have access to Doug, you know, for clarification and to help understand and, um, his, his written work, how much more than the Holy Spirit used of God to breathe out the scriptures. So, you know, as you come to the word of God before you even begin, um, pray, um, that the Holy Spirit would open your eyes and give you the mind uh, to comprehend what it is that he has written there. And you have access all the time. And he invites and welcomes you to come. That's a great question. Good question. Yeah. Well, we're still waiting, waiting yeah. on some questions now. Right? Yeah. That was good. We have authors in our church. You know, um, mm -hmm. Dr. Stuart Brown has written some good books. And um, uh, Wade White has written great children's and creative books, and um, Sheila Levy has a book about the park here and uh, outdoors and the beauty of her photography. Yes. Um, I'm going to miss some people, but it's great. We, I'm just giving plugs for yeah. <laughs> so those like Doug Schofield, who has a new work uh, um, being released. It's we, this yeah. is great. We have another one. Okay. Is the Holy Spirit a person or a presence? Yeah, and very important. Well, I hope you heard me say the person word here this morning. Um, the Holy Spirit is not a force or a presence alone. Uh, the Holy Spirit is the third member of the Trinity. Um, the Holy Spirit is not the Father. The Holy Spirit is not the Son. But the Holy Spirit is his own person within the triune God, uh, mm -hmm. equally God. And so um, even though he manifests to us the presence of God the Father, God the Son, mm. that's one of the foremost roles of the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit. Um, he, is, he is not an um, impersonal force. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I remember uh, Mez McConnell who plants churches in Scotland where churches would never seem to thrive among the poorest of the poor and the most marginalized people. And I love Mez McConnell. And early in his Christian life, he was just so excited and passionate about Christ. And he was going with his pastor to uh, witness to people in their homes. And somebody in one of these homes, I mean, he was just early in his walk with the Lord. And they asked about the Holy Spirit. And Mez goes, oh, he's like, he's like the force in Star Wars. And he's like, the force can be with you. And he's like, and, and they're like, really? He's like the force? And they're all excited. And as they left and they're driving away, the pastor, you know, trying to gently just say, you know, Mez, um, the Holy Spirit is powerful and certainly forceful, but he's not an impersonal force. He's a, and Mez, he's so conscientious, he's like, pull, pull the car around. <laughs> We're going back. And he had to go back and clarify that he did not want to lead them astray. But yeah. just funny. And it's just yeah. him opening up that, you know, we don't have all the answers when we come to faith in Christ. We're babes. But we have to grow in our understanding of, mm -hmm. and, the, and one of the greatest things, the most important is who God is. Yeah. And that he is triune, oh my word. It's powerful. It's yeah. just so deep and powerful. So, good question. Yeah, I appreciate that. I just finished watching uh, episode six yesterday, so that's that's impactful for me. Um, and yeah, you you mentioned last week the the danger of overemphasizing um, the work of the Holy Spirit at, above above the uh, the work of the Son. 
um, and the sacrifice last week. So that is something um, that's good to keep in mind, that order of prayer, too. Um, it maybe helps us in terms of understanding their roles and uh, in their person personage yeah yeah maybe just comment really quick on that 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 all these analogies again god actually when he speaks to us through his word we think it's so hard and deep and profound but really he's the infinite all-knowing god and he speaks to us in baby language really just like uh you know i I actually got a really good buy speaking of a goodbye at, at winners here it was four books on the christian faith for young kids and at first I'm thinking is it even theologically sound and they were it was awesome books and the authors broke it down really well well in the same way God speaks baby language to us um, and so when he uses analogies and some of these things we have to be careful that when we think of the oneness of God we begin to think of the threeness when we think of the threeness we think of the oneness and there's those essential truths but when we over make too much more of, of some of those we it gets skewed and gets us into trouble. So we have to trust the revelation of God has given us Mm -hmm. and and not try to convolute it or to rely too much on, you know, analogies like the, they they attribute it to St. Patrick, whether it is or not, you know, the the clover leaf, you know, there are three leaves, but it's one and and, uh, water, ice, and steam, and they all break down. They're helpful to an extent, but they all break down and they could get us in trouble. Right. So we have to be careful as well, yeah. um, not to, uh, again, go too far in some of these things. Right? Absolutely. Uh, Pastor Siobhan has, has told us that uh, we received a prayer request. Um, she wants, wants you to know that uh, our prayer team is going to be praying for that. Um, and we received uh, another prayer request from Demi, Debbie McLearn um, to continue to pray for her in her decline of health. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, unless we get another question, and, and if we do, maybe we'll be able to deal with it, but we should, we should close in prayer. Sure. Um, Pastor Chris, I'm going to ask that uh, if you could pray for Debbie. Yeah. And, and I, I would like Pastor Chris also to pray. We knew it was going to come. We're seeing the fallout, not only in economic ways, but the fallout of mental wellness and relationships uh, more and more in increasing ways. Mm-hmm. I think, again, we, we've not even realized the extent to the anxiety and stress, what it's, what it's caused in our lives, and the angst of we thought we could have accomplished more or done better, and now we're stressed out because we're, we're needing to get back to work, we're needing to f- daycare and everything else, mm-hmm. and it can just overwhelm us. So um, it's, we need grace and patience with ourselves and to be still and know that he is God. So I'm just, mm-hmm. if you could remember that too. Sure as we remember Debbie and others as we pray at this time. Thank you, Pastor Chris. God, we thank you for this moment that we have um, to be able to pray to you, Lord. We thank you that we have access to you uh, through your son, Jesus, and by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you um, for the ability to pray, to share our lives uh, with others, um, to share with each other our, our needs, oh God, and to bring them before you in prayer. Lord, we trust you and we, we know that you are um, in control of the situations in our lives. And so, Lord, we, we bring before you um, the prayer requests that Pastor Siobhan shared um, and also Debbie McLaren, oh God. Um, and I pray, Lord, for healing and restoration, oh God. I pray for peace uh, in the midst of uncertainty. And Lord, for those who are facing great uncertainty, oh God, all around, all around us today, oh God, because of the coronavirus, the impact, the fallout, um, family relationships, oh God, um, that are broken. Um, Lord, we pray that you would mend relationships, oh God, that you bring healing and restoration. Lord, for those who are, are, are experiencing anxiety, stress, uh, depression, for those who have mental health issues that are compound it and um, become increased, Lord, because of the isolation. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would bring them peace, oh God, your peace, overwhelming peace and comfort. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that your love, Lord, the love of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Lord, would be with them. And Lord, that we as a community would surround them 
uh, to the best of our ability. Lord, help us see where we need to be. Help us to be present in any way that we can. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your grace, Lord, when we fail. Uh, we pray for your strength, oh God, your power, your discernment. Lord, help us love as you have loved us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And just as you go, by way of a benediction and practical homework, um, in these days, we would ask God to clean out our spiritual hearing and our insensitivity, that we would not remain tone deaf. Um, look for ways to uh, peacefully but actively um, address racial tension and injustices in the world. And in these days of COVID and social distancing, it occurred to me with that uh, gesture that Mr. Rogers is Tom Hanks. We can't hug, maybe we'd like to hug, but let's, let's utilize the most beautiful word in sign language when we see someone and make a friend with somebody who's totally different, but say, hey, do you know? And, and then go like this, this means friend. Can we be friends? That's not trite, but that's good. So as a benediction, uh, let's use that. Let's share that around. I can't hug you, but we could be friends. Mm-hmm. And may God use it to bring him glory. Amen. Pastor Jen, we just have one, one more question. Um, how can I know that I am honoring the Holy Trinity? Is it a feeling, a sense of calm um, at a deep level? Yeah. Uh, again, we want objective truth, the word of God, because our emotions can lead us astray. We can, just like Eve, you know, we get doubtful, distrust God. Is he really good? I don't see him. I can't, you know, it's by faith. Yeah. And, then, and then we look for love in the wrong places because we want a tangible feeling. Yeah. So we have to resist that, look to the objective word of God, believe what he says, believe his word. And as you believe it, I believe it will rise up within you joy, You'll feel the embrace of God the Father. You're going to feel the empowerment of the, of the Holy Spirit. You're going to rejoice mm-hmm. in the beatific vision of what you see in the life of Jesus in the Gospels. Mm-hmm. And Martin Lloyd-Jones has the most beautiful analogy. He talked it about, like, it's like a father walking along a path out in the beautiful creation, and they're just walking along, Hannah, his young son, and they're walking. You know, they're doing life. Mm-hmm. They've got a relationship. But then all of a sudden, the father scoops the son up in his arms and gives the son a big hug and whispers in his ear and says, I love you so much. Mm. And then just puts the son down and they walk on and the son's just bursting. He's going, where did that come from? I know he's my dad, but he just told me how precious I am to him. That's what you'll experience. Don't look for it. Don't worship your feeling. Mm -hmm. Don't get your expectations out of whack, but just be faithful to learn. The father says, go to my word. This is my love letter to you. Learn, and you're going to experience times where all of a sudden he picks you up and he whispers in your ear, I love you so much. Amen. Thank you.